My name is Chris, though you might recognize my voice from another channel called Stohov, where I do various tutorials for Fantasy Grounds Unity. In this collaboration with Smiteworks, I will be walking you through the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Critical Role Call of the Netherdeep campaign module. The Call of the Netherdeep was released in March of 2022 and is an adventure campaign guide that takes place in the world of Exandria. As I was reviewing the complete module, I came to the conclusion that it was going to be a very complex module to run, and as such, I rate this as an intermediate or higher level campaign. Someone who is just starting out as a dungeon master is going to struggle to run through this campaign, and while it's not impossible to do, a new DM is going to have issues tracking all of the facets of the campaign that need to be kept in mind. It uses a group of rivals to turn the entire campaign into a long-running race or versus campaign that has many different potential outcomes at the conclusion of each chapter. Tracking those outcomes is going to be the trickiest part of the whole campaign, in addition to tracking the rivals, but I will do my best to provide some guidance on how to keep all of that straight. Additionally, this module connects the players to a significant event in Exandrian history called the Calamity, though several centuries after the events themselves have occurred. It does this through a series of seven segment adventures, although technically they're all linked together. It's a continuous chain, and they're organized by chapter. It is all going to start with level 3 characters and progress them all the way through to level 12. The adventures set the party on a course that reveals more about the Calamity, while gaining an understanding of a creature called the Apotheon, and how Elixion, as he was once known, saved Exandria from total destruction. His fate, however, is now placed into the hands of the party as they attempt to either save him from his torment or destroy him. Once again, there are going to be two versions of this video. A shorter version of the video is going to expose you to the module and what it encompasses for a series of adventures. The second version of this video is going to be much longer and it will go into more detail in some areas, offering suggestions on a few things, indicating a few things to keep in mind, and even potentially provide a few examples. I will be sure to cross-link each video so that you can access the other version of the video from the one you are currently watching, therefore you can get the full context of what you're looking for. This video is going to be slightly different from the other walkthroughs I've completed thus far, and it's to test if the content provides the information you might be looking for in a more appropriate format. If you are not a dungeon master, this video should be safe to watch, but you might want to skip the chapter sections if you want to avoid any spoilers. Mainly because I will be using those chapter sections to point out the key areas a Dungeon Master is going to need to pay attention to. The module itself is on both the Fantasy Ground Store and the Steam Marketplace, including both of the bundles that are available for the Completionist Bundle on each Marketplace. So if you already have a large number of modules and wish to save some additional cash, you can make use of those bundles to do so. However, you should be aware that this module does not fully function properly for the most part without the Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, and the Monster's Manual, and I highly recommend purchasing those additional modules if you do not already own them. The reason is because there are some references to various tables, items, and creatures or NPCs that were simply linked to the existing elements in those modules. Additionally, another supplemental module, called the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, provides more information about the world of Exandria. However, it is not required in order to play through this module, but I still recommend picking it up as well in order to provide a fuller picture of what the world itself looks like. Due to the way that this module was converted, you might also require the art subscription to be able to load some of the maps that are used within Fantasy Grand's Unity. Unfortunately, however, it's not clear what map packs those are actually required for, so I am unable to provide links to the specific packs that might help to reduce that cost over time. You will find links in the description of this video for all of the modules, bundles, as well as the art subscription to ensure that you have quick access to all of the above resources. In order for you to be able to load the module, you will first have to have purchased it through the links I provided earlier, as well as run the Fantasy Grounds Unity updater utility. This will make the module available to Fantasy Grounds Unity through the library category, specifically within the modules panel. If you've never run Fantasy Grounds Unity as a DM before, you will most likely not have any modules loaded, as you can see here on my screen. To do that, you will need to click on the activation button here down at the bottom left of this modules panel. Over time, as you purchase more modules, you will eventually find that the module activation window can get a little cluttered. 
So the easiest method to find the module that you're looking for is down here in the search box at the bottom left of the screen. All we have to do is type in the keyword nether and we'll see the modules that we want to be able to load into Fantasy Grounds. All you then have to do is simply click on the load button. And depending on how recent your system is, that can take some time to complete, so don't panic if it appears to be taking a little bit of time. As this module does have other dependencies, this is also a good time to load the Dungeon Master's Guide, Player's Handbook, and the Monster's Manual, and if you happen to have it, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. I won't be doing that as part of this video, just so that I can show you all of the elements that are unique to this particular supplement. One thing I do want to point out here, though, is that even though there is a player's version of this particular module, all it really does is supply images to the player for a couple of items that are introduced as part of this particular module. It's entirely up to you as to whether you enable that so that players can load it or whether you yourself even load it. So as a dungeon master, if you want to keep things minimal, you don't necessarily need it, but it's there if you want it. All it will do is prevent the players from actually being able to see those images. So no harm done. The Call of the Netherdeep module provides all of the story elements, save for some of the creatures and items, that are used to run the player through this particular epic set of quests. There are a number of panels that will contain important information that you might want to reference at some point, and they are as follows. Within the Encounters panel, you're going to find all of the pre-generated encounters associated with various locations of this campaign module. The Images panel is going to show you a digital copy of all of the images that you would normally see in the printed and PDF versions of the supplement. The Items panel itself is going to show you all of the items the party can find throughout the various adventures, as well as some basic equipment. The NPCs panel is going to contain all of the information sheets and stat blocks for all of the various NPCs the party is going to encounter, as provided by this module. It does not, if you don't have the other elements loaded, include anything from the Monster's Manual or the Dungeon Master's Guide. The Parcels panel is going to find everything that you are going to award to the party as some kind of loot parcel found throughout the various adventures. Within the Story panel, you are going to find all of the information sheets that are going to guide you through this epic campaign, as well as all of the reference material to help you understand the adventure and how it connects to Exandria. Within the Tables panel, you're going to find some of the random roll tables that are used at various stages of the module, be they by the party or by you in relation to how things might affect the party in some way, shape, or form. And finally, I need to point out that this module does not contain quest items that are usually found in various modules, and that is primarily due to the fact that this module is geared, for the most part, on leveling up characters through specific points within the epic arc. And as usual, all of these particular panels are available from the category campaign here, and if you don't have it expanded out, all you have to do is click it to drop that down. Due to the level of complexity of this particular campaign, the place you're going to want to start is going to be within the reference manual that is actually published as part of this module. You can find that by clicking on the adventure campaign guide here and access the reference manual in order to pop that open. As a dungeon master, I recommend that you start with the introduction. Well, it's obvious. I mean, it's called the introduction. That's generally where you would figure you would start. But in this case, it's extremely important because it's going to give you the background on Exandria if you don't already have that knowledge. It's also going to fill in other information that you're going to need in order to properly run this campaign. And that's the purpose of the reference manual. It's a really good place to start because it's going to provide you a broken out table of contents via the left side menu and give you an easy means to move through the chapters as you read through them. The story panel also works but you have to work at it in order to find the information that you're going to be looking for. However, you can reduce some of the workload of trying to find the information by clicking on this little drop down menu up here so that you can actually focus on the individual chapters that you're going to want to review. So all this section here covers everything that is part of the introduction. This section here is essentially an overview or a table of contents of everything that you're going to get involved with in relation to the module. Whereas the other ones are all the chapters that are associated with each of the individu individual adventures that you're going to be putting the party through. Although they're not technically individual adventures per se, they are in the way that they're organized by chapter. But really, it's one long epic campaign that is separated out into various chapters and broken up into multiple paths because of that structure. I highly recommend that you read through this introduction chapter a couple of times until you have a really good handle on the information stored within it. 
And that's because it covers a lot of the history that you're going to need to know in relation to Exandria itself, as well as the various regions that the campaign takes place in. Additionally, it provides details about the Apotheon and other elements of this particular campaign that you as a dungeon master are going to have to really understand. These concepts can directly affect the party members in different ways, and you're going to have to understand how those effects are going to come into play. Things like corruption of the players, the rival party that they're going to have to deal with throughout the campaign, as well as providing rules on how to handle many of the aspects of the environment that the player is going to have to work their way through. I've included some more detail of this in the longer video if you're interested in gaining some assistance with that aspect of this particular module. The first chapter, called A Faithful Competition, is where the story is going to begin, and it starts in a city called Zhigao, which is on the northern coast of Zorhas, where the river Ifalon meets the ocean. You can find this chapter via the reference manual or through the story panel, though it won't be immediately visible because what you have to do is actually drop this down in order to gain access to it. Uh, that's not it. There it is. Sorry, I still had my uh, previous keyword search in there. This chapter is broken into two parts, with the first being a set of competitions that take place within the town of Zhigao, and the second being a dungeon dive in order to complete the first quest of the campaign. As a dungeon master, you are going to want to pay close attention to the running this chapter section because it's going to provide the details about how this chapter is going to work for you. Additionally, this is the chapter where you use the group of rivals that the party is going to constantly run up against through various portions of this module for the very first time. And because of that, I recommend that you let the party know in advance that it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to actually utilizing these rivals and that way they have an ex a level of expectation that is set in advance. As I indicated earlier, this first part of the campaign begins with a series of competitions one might usually find at a carnival or a festival, and they are mini games that the party members can actually compete in. How many of these you run should really be up to the players, as they are only going to play those that they feel are enjoyable. There is no need to play through all of the games unless the party themselves wants to, and if you feel that the session is taking too long, you can have Elder Ushru summon the participants to a centralized meeting area where you can begin to move the campaign forward again. The second portion of this chapter is about a race through an underwater grotto, and this is where you as the dungeon master are going to have to keep a close eye on how long it takes for that party to move through each room. Each section of the grotto has a specific number of rounds it takes for the party to pass through, in addition to other challenges that might actually crop up. The challenge for you is also keeping track of the rivals as they pass through another aspect of the grotto and calculating who is going to arrive at the final room first. I recommend that you make use of a non-public note, and as each party moves through a particular room, you simply make note of the room as well as how long it took for that party to pass through it. Doing so will allow you to keep a mental picture of where each party is within the grotto, and for the rivals you can use a particular token if you wish to be able to track them outside of the visual range of where the players can see. Lastly, the chapter provides two possible outcomes from the results of the final contest, and it's either going to be where the party is victorious, or they're not. And those two outcomes branch out into actually three outcomes, so the party either succeeds, the rivals have succeeded, or something in between, and I'm going to let you figure out what that is. As a result, it provides some suggestions on how to keep the campaign moving forward, but you are still free to use your own guidance here, as these might not cover how your party has completed the story of this particular chapter. In the longer video, I give an example on how to run one of the festival games, as well as describe how to track the rivals during the final contest. And that about sums up the key concepts that you'll need to keep an eye on during this chapter, and I don't want to spoil anything else in relation to it, so let's move on. With Chapter 2, it's all about getting to Bazoxan which is the next key interest point for the campaign, and as such, this could be a single session as it's primarily a traveling scenario with a few encounters along the way. Once again, focus on the running this chapter and after the festival sections, as they will explain how you should start this part of the adventure based entirely on the outcome from chapter one. However, you'll also want to pay very close attention to the details in the after the festival section of this chapter as that's going to set the path the party is on. It really comes down to whether the party was able to acquire the Jewel of the Three Prayers, or if the rivals did, and as well as what the demeanors of those rivals are towards the party. And this is going to be an overriding concept that you're going to have to deal with for each chapter, and this is a good one to set a few habits right off the get-go that will allow you to track the states of things over the life of the campaign. We've already talked about tracking the demeanor of the rivals of the party, and this is going to be required over the entire duration of the campaign, but you'll also want to start tracking where you think the rival party is in relation to the players. 
Is the rival party ahead of where the player's group is? Are they chasing after them? Or did they agree to travel alongside the group? These are all things that you have to take into account. This, in combination with the individual demeanor of a rival party member towards one or more of the players themselves, is going to provide you the content to interact with the party members going forward through this chapter. Essentially, it's how are you going to roleplay that particular rival party member in relation to interactions with a given party member. Of course, that's in addition to the content of the camp that the party is most likely going to spend a night or two at in this particular chapter. The other main element of this chapter are the random encounters that will happen. It is clearly defined as to how many there will be as the party moves towards Buzzaxon, and it all comes down to how fast that party is traveling. By the start of this chapter, the party should already be at level 4, and should be able to handle most of the encounters that they will run up against, though some of them will be very difficult encounters. The longer video itself does have a few extra points that you might want to consider, but other than that, you should be pretty good with the information I've thus provided in relation to the shorter version of this video. In relation to chapter 3, this is the chapter where the party is going to find their direction, and is introduced to the concepts of factions with whom they gain either gain favor with or run afoul of. Once again, you should go over the running this chapter section and study the layout of the city, as well as go over the Bazaxan overview section of this chapter several times before you run this party through it. It will reduce the amount of delay in dealing with finding relevant information that you might be looking for, and it will prepare you for handling the various directions the parties can take. And this is because this chapter does not function in a linear fashion. It's in this chapter that the rival party also either coalesces into a solid group or breaks down and creates avenues for internal strife. This should be tracked alongside the rest of the data you are keeping specific to the rival party, and these changes are going to become important later on in the campaign. My recommended approach to this is to make use of notes you've already been using and should already be using to simply expand out the level of detail you're taking in relation to each of the overall rivals. You can also add in things about faction members as well as resident NPCs that you feel the party will most likely continue to interact with. As this is the last chapter that is going to take place on the Wildmount continent, you should provide the party time to be able to close off any outstanding issues if possible, though some avenues of this chapter might actually not give the party that chance. Once they've completed this chapter, they will move on to Marquette in order to continue tracking down the information that they will need, and continue on with the rest of the adventure. Even though this chapter has a number of different paths that the party can take, they are all clearly covered within the context of the sections specific to those confrontations or directions, specifically next steps, which I'm going to leave for you to explore as I don't really want to spoil everything during this video. This chapter, specifically chapter 4, is where the meat of the campaign begins to really take shape, and it's where the party is going to gain stronger relationships with one or more of the factions that are going to either help them move towards their overall goal or hinder them at some point in the future. The relationships developed by the party while they were in Bazaxon carry forward into this chapter, and they help with the initial groundwork on opening doors with one or more of those factions. It should also allow the players the choice of what faction that they want to gain closer ties with, unless they really badly burned bridges with the given faction in previous chapters. If they did completely sour a particular relationship with a faction, it is possible these factions are now hostile to the party, and will most likely remain so during the remaining duration of the campaign unless steps are actually taken to try to mend those social bridges. This chapter also pushes the player level up to level 8, and once they've completed a number of faction missions, sets the groundwork to reach level 9, although they won't actually reach level 9 until they get into chapter 5. Beyond that, the party should have some level of freedom to move about the city, and the factions can be used as guideposts in order to move the campaign forward when you feel they've had enough downtime or resolve some specific aspects of information gathering that is now going to allow them to move forward. Running this chapter is extremely similar to the previous chapter, so as long as you pay attention to all of the same points, although updated them to the factions that are here, you should be pretty good in relation to running this chapter. I do, however, in the longer version of the video, go through and explain a couple of additional points just to help you keep things in mind. However, this is going to be one of the last locations that the party can go through and arm themselves up, gather the last few pieces of information or equipment that they want in order to move on to the next sections, and this is all related to items that are not necessarily considered to loot items. So this is a perfect, quote unquote, chapter to go shopping in is essentially what I'm saying. But from that, let's move on to the next section.
Chapter 5 is where the party can finally begin to capitalize on the various relationships that they've built with those factions in the previous two chapters, as well as with the rivals if they are on good terms with them. This is also where the rivals make a bit more of a return into the overall appearance within the chapter, and it might even be the first time the party bumps into them again after Bazaxon. Additionally, the rivals will now have upgraded to their final stat block, and it's the tier 3 version of their characters, and they have now also hit their final emotional and psychological states of mind that can really impact how each rival member behaves. And this is the most complicated chapter when it comes to role-playing the rivals, as you're going to have to find a way to convey those emotions and psychological states to the party players as they interact with those rivals. In any event, however, this chapter is mostly a dungeon crawl, the results of which will set the framework for the final chapters. The party will have the potential to obtain levels 9 and 10 during this chapter if they meet the conditions defined by the character advancement table of the introduction running the adventure section. Much like chapter 4, the party can take multiple avenues in relation to gathering the information that they need, and as such, the party should spend quite a bit of time here in this chapter. Other groups might simply skip a good portion of this particular chapter and blitz through the areas that are leading to chapter 7, so the DM is going to have to deal with things a little bit differently during this chapter, depending on how the party runs through it. And once again, I'm avoiding going into too much in the way of detail here because I don't want to spoil anything for a player who might be watching, or for a DM who wants to find out how this adventure progresses on their own, because that's what this is, is it's a, an adventure progression chapter. However, I do provide some advice with respect to this chapter in the longer video, but I've already covered all of the main points specific to this chapter. With respect to chapter 6, this is where the party begins to make their way through the Netherdeep and towards the prison of the Apotheon is the last full dungeon crawl the party is going to make before they encounter the Apotheon, but there is a catch. The Netherdeep is an underwater realm in an extra-dimensional space, and as such, underwater combat, navigation, and survivability rules are going to come into play. This chapter is very good at explaining how to handle that because there are additional elements that you also need to consider for this section of the module, and that is primarily the water pressure being placed on the party because of the nature of that extra-dimensional space. There is also the additional ruidium element in much larger quantities that is also going to have an effect on the party, depending on how long they remain here, and what effects it will have overall, if they are not already under the effects of ruidium corruption. It is highly likely that one or more party members actually have items that are already corrupting them with that element. So you're going to have to take all of these into account if you haven't already been doing so. The party, in theory, should also see most, if not all, of the remaining visions that are going to relate to Elixion, depending on how thorough the party goes through this particular chapter. The goal of the party should be in relation to finding all of the required fragments, which will allow the party to enter the heart of the prison. And if they so choose, find additional shards along the way, because there is a minimum number of those fragments that are required in order to get into the prison. The shards are the triggers that enable viewing many of these visions that the party is going to see, though there are other triggers as well, but I'm going to leave those for you to find. And finally, before we move on to the final chapter, the rivals once again are in play during this chapter, and you are going to want to make sure you look into how they should be played, paying close attention to the rivals in the nether deep section of this chapter. Once again, you can move the rivals around and determine where the party is going to bump into them once again, if the rivals are still in play, and go from there. What do I mean by if the rivals are in play? Well, it's entirely possible that the rivals themselves don't make an appearance for the remaining duration of the campaign. It all comes down to the disposition of the party as well as their emotional states. If they completely broke in chapter 5, there's a very good chance they are not involved in this chapter. Or if they are, they're in, on an individual basis. And this is where that disposition of a rival party member towards a given party member comes into play because they might decide to accommodate the party as they move forward through this section. Once you're comfortable with everything, just let the players guide the direction they take towards the final chapter, as that is going to ensure that their story is unique and entertaining, or potentially frustrating depending on how things fell in relation to the overall dice rolls, or the information that they've discovered. Beyond that, there's nothing else I really need to cover in relation to this particular chapter, so let's move on to the next one. Chapter 7 is the final chapter of the campaign, and this is going to be where the party gets to make their choice and either run the risk of more harm to the world or curing it of its affliction. Before you run this chapter of the campaign, you're going to want to be sure you read through all of the sections 
within this chapter multiple times until you've almost got the information memorized. And the reason is it's the only way to really prepare yourself for whatever outcome the party triggers by their choice. It's also going to reduce the delay in conveying those details to the party once done. And it's also going to provide you a mental framework of concepts and ideas that you can use to convey those changes to the party as they return to the world of Exandria. However, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's overly detailed. It can just be sort of like a mental concept or idea that you can use that might then trigger a huge blurb, if you will, when it comes to the description once you've figured out what choice they've made. However, I'm really not going to go into any details about the conclusions of this chapter, and that's to prevent spoilers for both the players and you, the Dungeon Master. As the DM, you've been just as involved through the entire story as the party has been. And, as long as it's a story that you're interested in narrating, you've kind of invested a little bit into it. As a result, it is best that I leave most of the discovery of this chapter to you, and that's to help maintain the level of surprise and satisfaction, hopefully satisfaction, that you're going to feel when the party makes it to the stage of the campaign, and also what the surprise and potential satisfaction or fear of their conclusion is going to be. However, all of the information you need in order to run this last big encounter is defined within this chapter, but how you choose to run it is still entirely under your control, though guided by the actions of the players. This campaign is one of the most complicated campaigns I've ever read through, and it might even be more complicated than the Out of the Abyss campaign, even though it has less branching storylines. The results of this campaign are going to forever change your local version of Exandria. This is, however, a good thing because it helps to breed new stories that you can then weave for your players, and find a new interesting way in order to keep your players engaged in that world, and have fun in the process. I want to thank you for watching this video, on behalf of Smiteworks and myself. And I also want to thank Smiteworks for providing me the opportunity to present this information on their channel, and I look forward to continuing with our collaboration. Please click the like button if you found the information in this video useful to helping you learn how to use Fantasy Grounds Unity and how to use this module. Also, consider subscribing to the Smiteworks Fantasy Grounds YouTube channel to keep up to date with new content as it is released. If you have any questions or comments about the video, feel free to post them in the comment section of the video below for others to see and contribute to the discussion.